Peter Leon is a partner at Weber Wenzel and one of the country's leading experts on the mining industry. He now joins us from our studios in Cape Town to look at mining policy in South Africa ahead of that policy conference uh, in December for the ANC. Morning, Peter. You've got this presentation which you've done, I think, for the Institute of, Inter of uh, Race Relations. And the headline on it is Marikana, Manguong and the mining industry. So that's as good a way as any to, to, for you to set the scene. Yeah, David, it was actually for the Institute of International Affairs uh, in Cape Town last night. But, but essentially what I looked at is the impact of Marikana on Mangaung, which is the ANC's elective conference in the middle of December, and the South African mining industry, because I really think that the events of Marikana two weeks ago are, in a sense, an epiphany for the South African mining industry and indeed for the country. And, you know, it's, it's a line in the sand. It was a terrible incident, and, and really what I was saying is we can, despite you know, the underlying tragedy of Marikana, we can use it as a, a basis of, of building a more inclusive and sustainable mining industry in this country. Peter, there's been allegations that, uh, and it's partly to do with the ANC's elective cycle, because they elect the, the leaders of the party, and then two years later the, we have a general election. And uh, in, a, in a sense what's happening is that you have an election, then you wait for two years and so no one wants to do anything. Then you have that election for the national uh, presidency. And, but then there's another elective mm -hmm. conference coming up. Now, what will the effect of this disaster in the mining industry, but also more broadly that the mining industry is under pressure for various reasons, how is it going to affect that elective conference for the ANC? Because it certainly has concentrated the mines. I think it will. I mean, one doesn't know the outcome. I, in fact, was, I've been asked the question a few times, what impact does it have on the succession in the ANC? But clearly, it has rattled the ruling party, I think, is almost nothing has done before. But the problem from the mining industry perspective is that it adds to all the uncertainty. Because you've already had, you know, the call from the Youth League for the nationalization of the industry, which has been pushed back by the ANC leadership. At the same time, you've had the SIMS report, which is the state intervention in the mining and mineral sector report by the ANC research team headed up by Dr. Paul Jordan, which in a sense, although it was launched in February, has sort of been kicked into touch by the policy conference. You've got all this, in a sense, sustained uncertainty over the industry, which is certainly not good for investment. And the Marikana episode coming on top of that has played out very badly in the international community. And if that were not bad enough, You've got all the problems in the platinum industry, which in a sense Marikana highlighted, where costs have gone through the roof and the price has either remained static or actually gone down. Um, and you know, that, that's obviously putting huge pressures uh, on, on the platinum mining industry in this country. So you know, it's all the, the, the confluence of all these events, um, I think, really requires a new deal and a new approach to the mining industry. And one of the things I, I said in my presentation was the need for a new approach to black economic empowerment because I really think it's been far too narrow based. That narrow based empowerment has in fact been a, a wonderful catalyst for people like Malema to call for the nationalization of the industry. And I simply don't understand why the government has not made uh, black economic empowerment for workers and communities mandatory under the mining charter. I, I've never had a direct answer to that question because I've asked them the question. Yeah. It seems to me one way of trying to fix this problem. The other way, of course, is to do something about communities, which the Marikana episode, I think, vividly highlighted. Uh, and I've done work in, in West Africa, where in Sierra Leone and in Nigeria, you actually have community development agreements uh, with mining companies for communities which actually give the communities a real, you know, a substantial r stake uh, in, in mining operations in a meaningful sense. Mm. Uh, you have to ask questions and you do in your presentation. You say there's several questions, you know, why, did the why was the police unit uh, firing live ammunition? Why was it not a different kind of unit trained uh, to deal with a situation like that? One of the questions you ask though is about the ministers of mineral energy and uh, of labour. And one gets the sense, uh, I think confirmed by your presentation, government's eye not on the ball. Uh, they're firing at targets that have moved already. We have the nationalization noise, which is really not the issue. And uh, do you sense that government, uh, well, certainly I don't think has had a grip on this. Can it get a grip on it? Look, I, I think, the, 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 I mean, obviously a lot of this is going to be investigated by the Farlam Commission, which is a judicial commission of inquiry that President Zuma has set up, and let's give credit where it's due. It's a very far-ranging commission headed by a highly respected former judge with very extensive terms of reference. So I think Farlam will look at some of these, uh, many of these issues. 
But, you know, I have to say, I think that government was asleep at the wheel uh, when it came to Murakan. I mean, obviously, once the episode happened, then everybody uh, got involved, not least uh, President Zuma. But prior to that happening, and that was the point I made in the presentation, as you say, I mean, where were they? I mean, why wasn't uh, the Minister of Labor and the Minister of Mineral Resources actually involved with what was going on at Murakan? Was it actually the, the events were unfolding in, in the previous week. Mm. It was Isn't only the, the shooting yeah. that took place on the Thursday afternoon yeah. that suddenly spurred everybody into activity into some sort of activity mm -hmm. but I you know I think obviously it was a terrible episode but the point I was trying to make in the presentation is that one should use that as a basis to really mm -hmm. build a new deal a new social contract for the South African mining industry and I think that is desperately needed Peter also you what you want is people working together that they may be differences they can agree to disagree on certain issues but you do want that sense that there is a partnership and uh, especially now with these mines under pressure, you know, they were in good times, Sassel, for example, and the platinum industry a few years ago, these super profits, we have to tax them, windfall taxes, we've got to get the benefit of these minerals being taken out of our ground kind of thing. Now, uh, these companies are underwater, some of them uh, are really battling. Lonman is actually in a battle for survival, the people just aren't going back to work. We're also looking here for, for government not just to do different things in a tactical sense, but to think differently about mining and perhaps to support it more. Absolutely, David. I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the, the problem is all, a lot of the thinking uh, that underlies the Sims report, for example, is how can we get more out of the industry? How can we tax it more? How can we force the industry to beneficiate? How do we uh, force a lot, some of the local production uh, for local, you know, directed to local beneficiation? If it's not locally manufactured, then we're going to slap export duties on it. It's a very dirigist, demand-driven approach, the mining industry. And I'm, I'm really saying we need to step back from that and how the bearing in mind this industry represents about 60 percent of our exports although it's only about five percent of GDP it is the biggest private sector employer in the country 500,000 people working in it directly another half a million indirectly I mean this is a critical industry for the country for the balance of payments for the current account all these things and so really I mean I, th I think government needs to take a step back and say how do we actually get this industry to work for the good of the country and not keep trying to find methods to beat it over the head. I, I think that's the challenge. Peter, you uh, as a lawyer, you were in Lawyers for Human Rights. It's quite a while ago now in the 1980s and uh, this must have been deja vu for you in, in, in some ways. One also looks with concern at some of the statements being made by politicians at a time when everything should be calming down. I mean, does one start asking questions about incitement to violence? Well, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think the, the human rights aspects of the singer are, are deeply troubling. The fact that the police shot uh, 34 mine workers is obviously something that's going to have to be looked at by the Commission of Inquiry. Um, but uh, the point I made in my presentation was that you know, it did seem to be disproportionate to the, uh, the provocation of the police. And I now see that the, the, the National Prosecuting Authority is looking at charging the mine workers concerned with murder under the doctrine of common purpose. I mean, how that could possibly fly legally is, is completely beyond me. Because you can only have a common purpose operating in a, in a crowd which has a murderous intent towards people. And if none of the policemen died in that episode, I don't see how they could possibly be charged.